morning. Don't, don't you like those faces that are on the screen, those people? That's just a, what a wonderful cross-section of the world. A welcome to folks at Nova and Lincoln and online. Thanks for being with us this morning. I love how God works. I, 72 years ago, uh, my family moved for a year to Springfield, Missouri. And I lived three doors down from this kid named John David. We became friends and did everything. We were Marco Polos riding our bikes out through Springfield. We were spelunking. We were catching tadpoles, growing them into frogs in our mother's basements. They loved that. <clears throat> Fast forward 45 years to 1995, and we have moved here from California to work behind the scenes with people here in, in the capital. And uh, he shows up, John David shows up as a senator from Missouri. A few years later, he gets invited to a, a church in Concord, North Carolina. Any of you folks out there know where Concord, North Carolina is? It's, it's near Charlotte. And we drove down there, and on the way down, my friend, Senator Ashcroft, uh, said, I'm going to sing some songs. He's a gospel music singer. He writes songs and stuff. And he said, I want you to help me on one of the songs. Dick. I said, good, okay, we'll do it. And we practiced a little bit. And he said, I'll just give you a cue as to when you should come in. That night before the service, is a, a congregation of a couple thousand. It snowed four inches in Concord, North Carolina. It's like it's snowing four inches in Washington, D.C. It shuts the town down. That's essentially how that worked. And we go to the first service, and there are like 50 people. But, you know, you, you still go for it with 50 people. And it came to the place where I was supposed to help him with the song, and I'm sitting down here, and he gave me a cue, but I didn't quite pick it up. I just, for some reason, I was focused, but it didn't. And so he apparently said it again. He told me he said it again. I think he did. And I didn't move. And finally he said, is there anybody here who will help me sing this song? And from the back came a voice that said, I will. I'll come back to that in just a few moments. What is it about somebody who has a willing heart? On February 24th, this year, Russia invades Ukraine, and this unlikely person named Vladimir Zelensky, president, Soviet-born Jewish man, who's an actor, a comedian, right? I mean, that's his trajectory, stands up at one point when they offer him a way out, and he says, the fight is here. I, I need ammo, not a ride and has become symbolic of somebody who in the moment steps into a situation and says, I will. It, there's a crossroads in a country's life when that happens, when one person stands up, when one person steps into the moment, one person who swims upstream or fights the status quo. We're in a series called Genius. And uh, today, I want to talk about the genius of willingness. Two words that can change my life, change the setting, change the world. I will. Listen to, listen to the first chapter of the book, okay? This is a willing statement. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. That's an I will statement. Or Isaiah 6, 8, classic. Then Isaiah has seen a, a picture of God, if you will. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And then you read Jesus, what he does in Philippians, the second chapter. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. That's an I will action. This book is a treasure, a repository of stories of people who were willing to step in to the moment. Peter, who wants to walk on the water to Jesus, <laughs> Jesus can I come to you? Come. He steps out of the boat, didn't have far to step because it's a storm, the boat's on its side, he just walks straight out. Right? <laughs> the boy with the lunch, have any food? Here's my lunch. 
the widow who gives two pennies all she has. These are I will people. These moments are embedded in the grand story and that story of humankind has never changed in history. So 3,000 years ago, Israel walked away from God. You find that a fair amount in this book. I find that a fair amount in our life, my life. You know, too often I wander off, you know, and I need to be brought back to pay attention. That idea is a picture of humankind, and I want to reference today a couple of chapters from the book of Judges, introduce you to a guy, many of you know him, but this is how it starts out in Judges 6, 1. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites, because the power of Midian was so oppressive, and Midian, they were the eastern tribes, out to the east of what we consider Palestine, Syria back in the day, or Israel. Power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds whenever the Israelites planted their crops. The Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land, ruined the crops all the way to Gaza, did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. His response to them a few verses down in that chapter is, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The takeaway from that, of course, is that actions have consequences. We know that. Ideas have consequences. Actions have consequences. God had set his people free. Then they chose bondage. But there was one guy, one guy who was available, one guy who was willing, one guy who stood up, and God, Yahweh, Jehovah, initiates a conversation with that guy. This is how it starts. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the, the, excuse me, the Abizrite, where his son Gideon, he's the guy, was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. See, you see, God is recruiting a volunteer here, right? He wants somebody to say, I will. My experience over my years, whether it's in church planting or as a college president or hanging out here in D.C. or now where we are in Colorado, is that volunteers are like the coolest people. You can't pay them more. You can't pay them less. You can't tell them to get up early or stay later. They're going to do what they want to do within your framework, hopefully. that doesn't always work. But... Volunteers are up for whatever. And by the way, if you, if you want to think about that, if you want to think about an I will moment for yourself, you can go to this website here at NCC, ncc.re slash serve. I think the, the deal's on the screen here behind me. Is it on the screen behind me? Okay. It's coming. It's going to come on the screen. It'll, it'll be right there. It's ncc.re slash serve. And see what the opportunities are to engage. Because it's the engagement part of the kingdom of God that makes it work. It's the, it doesn't make it work, but it allows it to work in real ways. So anyway, what, what happens is the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. And he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. See, Gideon is doing something already. Gideon is threshing wheat to keep it from the Midian. He's doing something on, I think this is the right phrase. He's doing something on the down low. It, this, is a, this is a covert action. Did, did I get that right? Down? Okay, it's a covert action that he's taking. And God shows up, the angel of the Lord, and, and calls him out in the very best way. He calls him a warrior. God calls Gideon a warrior. He calls something out of him or speaks something into him. He sees what Gideon doesn't. Just like Jesus with, or God with Moses in the burning bush or Jesus with Simon Peter, there is that thing. Have you ever had a moment in your life when somebody has seen something in you that you don't see it in yourself? And they, they affirm you with it or they challenge you with it. They either call it out or speak it in, however that works. 
There's something about that that is profound. So the conversation continues. Pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. He doesn't even respond. He doesn't respond to the whine. He does not respond to the gripe. I spend a fair amount of my time whining at God. (laughs) I think he must sit over there saying, really? Anyway, he says, am I not sending you? It sounds an awful lot like Isaiah. You know, who will go? Who will go for me? Pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? This is the next line of defense. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. Got no status, no lineage, weakest group, weakest guy. That's not the point. The point is not, are you big and strong or low and weak? That's beside the point. The point is, are you willing? You see, God triumphs with a person of the willing heart. That's when the kingdom of God is seen from a person of the willing heart. And oftentimes it's an unlikely person. Here's a small tribe, the last guy in line. Here's King David, the last guy in the litter, if you will. You know, all of that. But they're doing something. Here here is Moses who tries to back away from the burning bush back in Exodus 3. And he says, "I, I stutter, you know. And God says, essentially, you go where I'll tell you to go and I'll go with your mouth. What do you have in your hand, Moses? How does it, that's the line of approach. I was president of a small college for some years, as many of you know, and one day, um, a young man, student who was a sophomore or junior, wanted to come and see me. I had not met him. He walked and sat on a tall, good-looking guy. And he just sat down and uh, his name was Tony. And... Uh, he started talking to me, and I had mentioned in chapel sometime in, in his hearing that from age five to about my late 20s, I, stu- I stuttered sometimes severely. And he walked in and sat down, and, and it took him a little while to get going, and finally he got it out and said, and I won't mimic him, I'll just say, you and I have something in common, President Foe said, what's that? And I knew what it was. He said, I I stutter. His story was that he had a twin brother and both of them were terribly abused by parents or foster, whatever, but terribly abused so much that his brother still did not speak or could hardly speak at the age of 25. And so he told me his story. He said, but I think God has called me to go into some kind of ministry. And I'm thinking in my head, I hope he has because this would be a great disappointment if it's not God's call. I said, what is it that you, uh, what is it that you want to do? He said, I think I'd like, I think I'd like to be a chaplain in nursing homes. I said, okay. I said, and and then he told me another piece. I said, Tony, when I speak in chapel the next time, could I just call you up? Just, let's just do it. And it'll be on whatever date it was. He said, okay. And I said, I'd just like to interview you a little. So I call him up. He's standing there. I said, Tony, tell us what you told me. So tell them what you, so he told me that. And I said, and I understand you're going to Cabrillo College, which is the local city college, and you're taking a rhetoric or a speech class. That's right. And I said, so, so tell us what happened. He, he said, well, I went to my teacher and I said, can I speak on any topic I want for the, for the five minutes or three minutes, whatever it is we have? And he said, yeah. So I, I talked about Jesus in my, in my city college class. Because the teacher said I could talk on anything. And he said, and I got to do that, and you guys don't get to do that because I stutter. And that's why I was taking that class. And he said, and I want to I wanna be a chaplain in a nursing home someday. And he said, I, I practice by going to nursing homes. And it really is, is fun because they don't, they don't care if I stutter. And... They can't hear me anyway. You know? <laughs> and as one who's hard of hearing, I totally get that now. I didn't get it then. 
willing. Tony was willing. That's what made it work. The Lord answered, I'll be with you, speaking to Gideon, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, if now I found favor in your eyes, <clears throat> give, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. See, now you can be willing, but nervous. Just putting that out there. You can be willing, but so, you know, it's like the old Princess Bride movie, you know. He's not dead, he's only mostly dead. You can be willing, mostly willing, but there's, you know. And so here's Gideon who has a whole series of these things. And I won't go into all of them except to say, you know, he, he goes and brings a gift. And there's fire out of a rock that consumes him. So that's, a, that's a good sign. And then, he, then they say, tear down the altars to Asherah. The, the Baal gods, if you will. And so they do that again on, on the down low. At night, they go and do that. And everybody gets up in the morning and says, who did this? You know, and, and anyway, you can read this. I'm not going to read it to you. You can read it in Judges 6. So, now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples joined forces, crossed over the Jordan, and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Here's the line. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. Now that's a moment. The spirit of the Lord came on Gideon and he blew a trumpet. This isn't like this kind of, it's one of those kind of trumpets. And summoned the Abizrites to follow him. He, he still needs a little encouragement. <laughs> He's talking to God. He says, could we, uh, could we do one more of those sign things? Just Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you promised. Look. I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there's dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know what you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And this is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day, squeezed the fleece, wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, don't be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry. Let the ground be covered with dew. That night God did so. Only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with the dew. I would submit to you that God shows his, his willingness because, see, we get our willingness because we're made in his image and he is, okay? God shows his willingness by his patience with us, with all of our backpedaling and saying, you know, really, I'm not comfortable. It's really outside my zone. It's not my sweet spot, whatever it is, you know? I don't know if you've ever done a fleece. God, I think it's you talking to me. Maybe I could Give me a little clearer sign here. You know, when I, when I was thinking that God was calling me to India as a missionary way back in the day, I used to ride my Vespa 150 motor scooter on my way over to Cal Berkeley back in 59 from Oakland. And, and I'd look up in the sky for clouds. Maybe it would say India. You know, just some, <laughs> some sign. And, and I think I saw an eye. I re, I, you know, I think I saw, turned out it was Illinois. Not, not India. We went, we went there for a dozen years. But the, but the point is, I don't think fleeces are bad, you know. I, it's, it's possible, I mean, because it worked here. I have a friend who's now an older man, and he, when I first came here, he had been uh, 30 years with the Central Intelligence Agency. And along the way, he was on the National Security Council at the White House in Asia Studies. And... Uh, he was going through a very difficult, challenging time, and somebody had introduced him to a, to a friend here in D.C., and that person, David is his name, he called from the White House to my friend because his whole world had turned upside down. Some of you have had those moments when your whole world turned upside down, when your plans were this way, and all of a sudden it's blown up, and you don't know what's going on. It was one of those moments. David was not a believer in Jesus, but he called my friend, and my friend said, I'll be there at the White House in 10 minutes, pick you up. They went out, sat by the Potomac, had a conversation. And uh, he said, you know, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't believe in God. I'm, I, I like being with you guys who believe in God, but I just don't. I, I'm not there. And, and my friend said, well, why don't, why don't we put out a fleece, David? Why don't we say to God, God, if you're real, I want you to sort of show yourself to me. I want you to just let me know that you're thinking of something like that. He said, okay, you know, why not? Tried everything else. And he said, the next day I, I got up to fly to New York City to speak to the Asia Council, 
some kind of foreign affairs situation. He said, I landed at LaGuardia. I'm going across the Triborough Bridge. And the cabbie says to me, sir, we need to pay the tolls. Do you want me to pay it? You pay me later. He said, no. And I handed him a $20 bill. And he handed the change back. And there were several $1 bills in the change. And I looked down at the first $1 bill. And across it in a broad, uh, what do you call those? Markers. Sharpie. In a broad Sharpie was printed, God loves you. And he said, I shouted, stop the car. Well, you can't stop on the Triborough Bridge. Well, maybe the Triborough Bridge just is stopped. But the, but, the, but the point is that he shouted, stop the car. And that was the start of his journey to come to faith in God through Jesus Christ. You say, what the, he said, I said, God loves you on a $1 bill. That was like the sign, the flea. He said, Dick, I've gotten thousands of $1 bills in my life. Never has one said, God loves you. I think God has a wonderful sense of humor. I think he comes at us ways that we, I know he comes at us ways that we never expect. He, he shows his willingness to us by his patience. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands. Here's the reason. Or Israel would boast against me my own strength to save me. We got the fighters, dude. When I am willing, I can experience God's glory. When I'm willing. Why? Because it needs to be clear that he gets the glory. Why does he need to have fewer soldiers? Because God, when we walk with him, the glory rubs off. But he's the focus. You know, I had the privilege some years ago when I was in town, there were a couple of folks who were relatively important and I'd go see them and walk with them and people started thinking I was important. And I wasn't. I was just their friend. I had no creds, no street creds. They had the creds. See, but when you walk with somebody who is important, the glory rubs off. That's why it's important to walk with Jesus because the glory rubs off. And here it says, here it says, if you do it this way, I won't get the glory. I need to get the glory. So announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So when he had blown the trumpet back a few verses, 32,000 guys showed up. So 22,000 men, Judges 7, 3, left. 10,000 remain. So like that, two-thirds of the army goes away because they're nervous, scared. Now, here are the stats in Judges 8. The, those tribes that had come across had 135,000 men to 32,000 men. That's four to one odds. That's terrible odds, but it's not, you know, the end of the world. 22,000 leave, so there's only 10,000. Now the odds are 13 to one. That's not the right direction. What's going on here? Well, God's ways are going on here. It's not about the numbers. It's not about the quantity. It's about the quality of who's the person you're walking with. That's how that works. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Gideon's got to be freaking out. Take them down to the water. I'll thin them out for you. There, if I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. If I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. Goes on and he gives them the dog test. The dog test is the persons who, who, who bend over and cup it and lap it like a dog so that I guess still alert, still looking around, as opposed to those who kneel down and just put their faces in the water. That's how we thin them out. So the, the kneel down people were 9,700. So 9,700 men leave. Now Gideon's started with 32,000. Now he's down to 300. Still willing. Just imagine. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Again, these aren't the little trumpets. These are the big, big babies. 135,000 Midianites against 300 Israelites. The odds now are 450 to one. And God's saying, that's more like it. And then on his own, he gives, he gives Gideon one more encouragement, a dream. This persistent, present God at every step gives, it, gives him another dream because God is willing. That's his heart, right? 
Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. He had snuck up to the camp in the night. I had a dream, he said, a round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. These are the guys, the Midianites, who are saying this. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. He returned to the camp of Israel, called out, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. It's like God gave him the last thing as an exclamation point. It's not just about Gideon being an I will person. It's Gideon and 300 other guys saying, I will. Let's do this thing. When I say I will, I often become part of a moment in history, in my own history and other people's history. So there were six moves. Because this is the God of precision, okay? Surround the Midianite camp with a line of men a few hundred feet apart. Attack late at night. So you got 300 guys, 135,000 people down there. Attack late at night to surprise and confuse the enemy. Sound trumpets from 300 different directions. Break pottery jars, raise torches. Shout a battle cry for the Lord and for Gideon. And Gideon's BQ, his boldness quotient, was up, Okay? Watch me, he told them, follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. And when I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. And I'm saying, what kind of a plan is that? (laughs) Apparently the best. Confusion in the dark, they start fighting each other. They run for their life. They're all taken out. Yahweh and Israel win big. I have a friend in this town who's now gone who who used to say, if you take your very best plan and turn it 180 degrees, that's probably closer to God's. (laughs) God's victories are markers in our lives. It was a once in a lifetime thing for Gideon. If you read the rest of the story, that victory only lasted his generation. He became a leader in Israel, but it only lasted. And as soon as he died, they went back to their other God. I'm not responsible for the next generation except to bless them and to try to build into them. But I am responsible, if you will, for my own generation in a real way. So we can look back at markers in our lives like that and say, that day I got to ride the wave, but he gave the victory because I was willing or you were willing. It's a marker on our journey in life with God. God showed up and did something that we couldn't imagine. So I, I heard this voice in the back of the church, this, you know, 50 people in an auditorium that has 1,200 seats or whatever, saying, I will, down in Concord, North Carolina. I turned to see who it was, and this fellow had stood up and was starting down the aisle. And I thought he was young. He looked young, but as he got down there, I could see that he was a bit older than that. He turned out to be 50 years old. His name was Paul, and he had Down syndrome. And he came walking down the aisle, walked up to the senator, put his arms around him, laid his head on his chest. And like that, of course, we're all there, right? And they started the tape for the song. And by that time, I was up there rather sheepish. It's part of the trio now. <laughs> and, and, we, and we sing the refrain of this song. And it was a moment. It was a mo- it, an unlikely person. Who would have picked that person to supercharge a moment? Who would have done that? The God of this book does that. He, it's not about high-born, low-born, rich or poor, this ethnicity or that culture or whatever. It's nothing about that. It's about who has the willing heart in the moment to respond to the call of God. We had a second service. There were, I think there were three, 400 people, second service. And so my friend John said, Paul, would you stay with us? And he he said he would, and he got up, and when the time came, he was there. And the further we went, the more he was into it, you know. By the time we got to the third service and we had 800 people, he was like Michael Buble or one of those guys. He was, he was into it. And at the end of that time, when the senator got ready to speak, it was my role to take him down and take him. There was a place next door where he lived, and he lived for many years after we were there. He just died a couple of years ago. But we got, we got about back there, about a third of the way back, and the senator was starting to speak, and Paul turned around and said, hey. And he said, yes, Paul. He said, 
I'm going to go eat lunch now, okay? <laughs> he said, that's fine. That's good. Here is the God who uses you in the moment and then lets you eat lunch and we're all good. <laughs> this is the God who by any definition, when you say I will, it can change a relationship, a family, a business, a congregation, a church, a nation. One definition of genius is the prevailing spirit of that person. I would like to challenge you this morning. What's your prevailing spirit? I would like to challenge you to look at the God who is most willing and say, God, let your spirit be in me so that my first response to your voice is, I will. Help it be, Lord Jesus. I choose to be an I will person. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the power of your spirit. Thank you that you were willing to create a world and to create a group called humans and take a chance. And in taking that risk, it didn't work out like you had hoped or planned it would, it seems. But you keep coming back through prophets and judges and all kinds of folks. And then you send your son. And when he said, I will go, I will go to the cross for Foth and friends. I will go to the cross for NCCers. I will go to the cross for people wherever they are simply because it's the thing that makes us whole. Thank you for helping us be I will people every day. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.